What up, what up, what up? I'm Brad Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with episode number 38 of No Labels Necessary Podcast, where you can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, wherever you listen to your podcast, chopping up about music, money, and the content creator economy. Now, today, oh boy, today, my first topic. Mm. I love this topic because it's how the social media platforms are tricking you and they're not going to tell you this but sir isaac hayes the third this man breaks it down so beautifully let's get into this first clip let's take the word follower and throw that out the window all right now let's take someone like kim kardashian that has 300 million followers well let's turn that to viewers how many people watch the super bowl this year 118 million how much do they charge for a 30 second spot seven million dollars mm. so if kim kardashian could post a piece of content and instantly reached 320 million people, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Not like the Super Bowl's on one day a year for four hours. She could charge $21 million every time she posted a piece of content. And the brands would come directly to her and never spend a dime with Facebook and Instagram to ever run an ad. So the moment that advertising came into play, platforms started to suppress your content because they have to limit your visibility so they can run advertising. That's how they make their money. But then this is how they trick you. But then they say, well, to get higher in the algorithm, post more content. But by posting more content, all that does is give them more content to run ads in between. Yeah. They said, oh, we're starting Meta Verified. Meta Verified, you can buy your blue check now, but it also comes with higher visibility, higher ranking in search. Yes. yes. That means your content was never reaching nobody. They were lying to you the whole time. You have to listen to what they're not saying as opposed to what they're saying. Yeah. They're telling you like, oh yeah, reach more people and get higher visibility. Fam, if I have 200 million people that want to see me and you're only showing me to 7 million people, you're playing with my money. You're playing with my reach. You're playing with my audience. I have a product to sell. I have a message to get out. Man, man, it's a lot. He said a whole lot. Broke that down beautifully. First of all, shout out to David Shans for that video. Y'all can follow him at David Never Sleeps. He interviews a lot of dope people, but man, I mean, I think one, we already know that that you're suppressing our, our views. Yeah. Period. Also, they've been pretty open about that. Right. They've been pretty open yeah. about it because people figured it out. Yeah. <laughs> so they had to go ahead and just admit it. It was too obvious, right? But I love the example he uses because that is the truth, right? People would just go straight to the content creator. Yeah. All right. So I get none of that money as the platform. So the only way I can force the advertising money to go through me is to make your number variable. You don't know exactly how many people you're going to get good out to. Right? Yeah. You yeah. can't guarantee those numbers. So it actually becomes more trustworthy to go straight to the platform and say, hey, I'm going to run this amount of ads, put this amount of money, right? And do those specific uh, formulas versus, all right, I'm going to get posted on Kim Kardashian's profile, but it might get 1 million, it might get 200 million, right? Mm. And, and who knows who'll see it? Because it's one thing to algorithmically say, oh, yeah, this is a better post, so it performs better, which so more of her audience sees it, right? But it's all another thing to say, well, anybody who's watching the Super Bowl is going to see it, mm -hmm. right? So it's like if anybody, all 200 million of my followers, all 1 million of my followers just saw it, and then they decided to like it or not, it would it would be a whole other story in terms of how much money we get paid, but we don't even know of all the people who are going to see it because people do pay for that. As yeah. long as it gets seen, we're good. Yeah, <laughs> that's how I used to run all my ads. Actually, uh, not not ads like my more social post campaigns back in like 2016 because I knew everybody was going to see it. I really didn't care too much about engagement in some ways because I was like, I don't matter. Cause I just need to drive this shit in their brain right now. And then I'm gonna get my engagement off this other post. I know coming two, three times down the line. All right. So you could run completely different social experiments now, but then once they start throttling your audience and I post this shit five times and there might be one person out of my audience that saw multiple and everybody else might only saw it once. Yeah. All right. It's a, it's, it's a different game, but, but yeah, nah, he's, he's on point with what he's saying, man. Like shout out to Isaac Hayes for sure. Yeah, bro. There's it's definitely some some evil genius shit with the platform. So what just clicked for me is is like you said, like, well, how can we stop 
advertisers for wanting to go straight to Kim Kardashian and straight to the influencer, right? We have to we have to be the barrier for that person to even grow enough for you to even care about that. So we can't directly take away from that money, yeah. right? But I can influence whether or not you even want to give that person money. That, that has a lot to do with this. And then the second thing I thought about it was, you know, it kind of goes back to, I guess, the consumer's role in everything, right? Because these... These, like, I guess, you know, we just call them taxations. They're basically taxing the artists for, right? Like, they only happen to influencers and creators, right? So the common person doesn't even know to argue for stuff like this because True. I'm not getting hit. You know, if I got 30 followers and all people that know me in real life, all 30 of my people are probably seeing my my content, right? Yeah. Um, or a post because Instagram knows I ain't trying to do nothing with it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not even trying to make money off my audience, but you person that wants to, you're doing things that clearly show like, you want to make some money off of this or you're at least acting like you want to make money, like, yeah, we got to put a barrier in between, right? So it does make me wonder how much of it is, like, how much of it is money in the sense of, you know, like, what would it look like if Instagram just let us touch our whole audience without the need for ads and things? Or like, what would that look like? Because I vaguely remember, it, what, like, maybe 2018, around that time when it was like that, but I didn't have a crazy following then yeah so i don't know you know what i'm saying like i don't i don't i feel like only people that have followings back then like no you know what i'm saying the rest of us been kind of playing within these weird invisible boundaries for a minute you know for as long as we've probably been content creators so it, it doesn't really like it didn't like hit me the same you know what i'm saying right well, i don't know how, what i'm missing out on i can do i can do the math and make some assumptions but i don't truly know so that's what i wonder about wonder is like what did instagram see that made them go like oh no we gotta try we gotta charge off of this type of reach you know what i'm saying exactly exactly bro i think like to that point if you think about a, as a content creator as an artist mm. whatever these platforms are always going to be playing this game yeah because this is to their benefit and it's up to us to understand how you can use it as a tool yeah facts. like you always need to be selling something. I sort of heard somebody say, wake up every day with something to sell, mm -hmm. which I love the way that shit sounds perfect. Whatever you sell, it doesn't have to be a physical product. It could be a message. Whatever you're trying to sell, wake up with something to sell and understand how you're going to use that visibility to sell that because this visibility might not be there tomorrow. So if I'm using TikTok and I'm popping on TikTok and I know TikTok's going to be on this wave, but it might not even be here in five months because I don't know, the government might get rid of it. That doesn't mean that visibility isn't valuable in that time, right? So I need to maximize that, have somewhere to push people to. And that might not mean, oh, just, just an email list, just like follow numbers, right? That might mean a product and I'm flipping this product in, in this period of time. And I think what people are willing to like acknowledge enough is some part of the game is always going to be temporary and of the moment. And then there's a part of the game that's going to be for the long, mm -hmm. right? So let's just say the NFT stuff that happened. Mm -hmm. NFTs could come back, whatever, right? But Tory Lanez, with all the stuff he has going on now, generally speaking, you look at Tory Lanez as a successful artist especially at that time like you know we're talking about like his run from 2008 to 2018 to like 2020 especially right really getting hot in this period as um, from the long haul standpoint he was set as an artist who has a fan base right and gradually still finding moments in his career and also being a songwriter nfts comes let's just say nfts would only last two years. Well, he made that meal off of that in that period of time where he sold all them and uh, oh, yeah, he had that project, yeah. right? Cool. You don't miss out on that meal when that opportunity comes. You go ahead and take advantage of it. Yes, it's short term. It's not going to be around forever, right? But still, you go ahead and take that meal. You're in position so you can take advantage of the short term. It's only when you don't have that core foundation that it becomes a bad thing when you get caught up in all these short-term things. Cause it's like now when that moment passes, you got to start from ground zero and then go find another way to cap off of the next moment. But when you already got your foundation, the world's your oyster cause you're building for the long term at the same time that you're capping in the short term. Yeah. 
And that's really what the ultimate goal is. So I don't think we should get caught up too much on whether YouTube is going to be hot forever or YouTube shorts is going to be hot for three months or TikTok's going to be hot for two years. It's done. It's one. None of these things are going to be hot forever. Yeah. And even if they stay hot as a platform, it's going to be different features on the platform that are hotter than others for periods of time. You know what I mean? Because they have to keep encouraging people to have an incentive to like go hard on a specific feature to keep the engagement mm -hmm. on. Like all that is going to continue to change. You just need to have your foundation, all right? So you can make sure you capitalize on these small moments of time, but still almost still be set in the long run and look at it like, hey, I'm just picking up folks. You know what I mean? Like I got my my fan base of a thousand and here go these core people. And then, oh, that moment came and it went, but shoot, at the end of the day, I picked up another 50 people from over here mm -hmm. and then I picked up a thousand people in that moment in time and I picked up another from these random, because it's no different than a, like a hit track. Like some songs will bring in more people, some will bring in less. Yeah. The platforms are that same way. Yeah, and, I, and like you said, the big thing to remember is that like all social media platforms go that way eventually. Right, that's, that's literally the social media formula. Yeah. Track people over here for free, you know, build an audience, build a, a, a community of thriving creators, and then boom, hit these motherfuckers with advertising. If you yeah. go back and look at every app, every social media platform in the last like, well, like 10 years, they all have followed the exact same model, right? So, you know, and we're seeing it now with TikTok. I'm saying engagement and things that, you know, 2020 we could have gotten for significantly less work. And today, you know, that same strategy doesn't get you a tenth of the video of the views or the creates. And you have to do things and spend money through advertisement to to to, to get to the same effect, right? So we're, we're watching it in real time happen with TikTok, you know what I'm saying? I, I remember watching it happen in real time with Instagram. I have to assume that at some point, YouTube shorts is gonna is gonna is gonna fall victim. Even though I think YouTube can afford to go longer without doing it because they already have such a rich YouTube ad ecosystem, right? They don't need the money as fast, yeah. you know, what I'm saying, as other platforms do. But eventually, they one the one day they go wake up to and be like, all right, that too, you know, what I'm saying like that that shit got to go too. So artists, you know, content creators, I think when you find these pockets, the cap on like realize that you went you in a window. You know, what I'm saying like you, you're either gonna wake up one day and this isn't going to be as free anymore yep. you know um or some damn near kill it all together like look at facebook like facebook or the gang right now is damn near non-existent you know what i'm saying um other than like the facebook shorts um so yeah it's the the, the those moments don't last long you know and like especially when it's with a new social platform like you have to remember it's hot because it's new right now you know what i'm saying everybody's talking about it um network effect is kind of happening and they're making shit free they're, they incentivize you to grow and so when you see that you need to act on it knowing that I might have maybe another year top of this shit going the way it goes. And I'm gonna have to pay eventually, you know, but let me cap on this shit while I don't have to pay right now. Yeah. Yeah. And shoot, I wanna actually share this other clip by Sir Isaac Hayes the third. Now, the teaser is basically look, black culture innovates but rarely owns. Okay. That's the direction he's coming from. Strong headline. A very strong headline. And He's actually touching on something that we just talked about in our podcast episode where we were going over um, hip hop. Is hip hop dead, right? So shut this clip out right here. You know that black culture is the economic engine of social media. Yes, like we get we give our dances to TikTok, our clap back to Twitter, our skits to Instagram, but we don't own any of the infrastructure. Right. Oh, the things that we do. One of the gifts and curses of being someone black is we are the apex of innovation, mm. but we innovate just naturally to the point that we create industries off of our innovation. I had a chance to find the Grandmaster Flash maybe about a month ago, and I just there's a, there's a, there's a phrase or a saying that I always use when I talk to people. I was like, the first time, and I told him this, I said, the first time you DJed on two turntables and a mixing, Somebody should have pulled you to the side and said, do not show a motherfucker what you just showed me. We don't show nobody. Let's go figure out how to build turntables and mix. Right, right. Because everybody that does this is going to need that. Right. Fast forward, DJ culture owned by Techniques. Yeah. Serato. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. Pioneer. Right. We, everybody should be DJing on the Flash 5000, whatever. Right. And Grandmaster Flash should be sitting up in a mountain somewhere with worth six, seven billion dollars because right. he created this culture. Right. I think that what he's touching on 
is just so important for literally everybody. If you're an artist, content creator, anybody, you don't even have to be black. Now, of course, this relates back to that hip hop conversation we were talking about um, and how black people innovate consistently culturally, but we don't scale our own like innovations because we move on to the next thing. You know, mm -hmm. we're fickle and all this. Well, this is cool. And we're just, you know, a lot of times get caught up in, in um, I don't even say flexing on each other, but just like, what's that new thing? One thing is hot, it's not. And it's like that within our own bubble not realizing it's still newer to the rest of the world mm -hmm. and what happens is you start looking at the rest of the world as that being a sign that is lame now right the fact that shit you were doing i was like oh now that they're using these words we got to make up some new words now that they're doing this dance we got to make up a new dance because that means it's not cool anymore but that's when the money starts to come yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. you know what i mean so the the mentality definitely has to switch and then you couple that with the other conversation the will i am conversation that's the other thing that isaac hayes was touching on essentially right yeah. it's like yeah you you could do this cool dj scratch trick but that can be used to sell these mixers yeah right? same product sell some hardware i mean sell, yeah selling hardware because you always have to be looking for something to sell. Wake up every day to, to have something to sell. And I think the that that's constantly something that artists have to be aware of because you're sit, putting yourself in a position where you're basically saying that you're an innovator in society or you want to be looked at as that way. You will be having people who are watching you and then copying things that you're doing if you're successful at what you're supposed to be doing content creators as well in many ways. So if you come up with something, yeah, these ideas come, but then you have to figure out, well, if anybody else wants to copy me, what would they have to use to copy me? That That's a good way to think of it. Cause I, I like the way he said it at the end is like, cause anybody else who wants to do this will need these to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Or even, I mean, I think the bigger thing is looking at how can I make money out of the copycatter? Like you said, cause right. Cause it's, it's like I said, like even if they want to copy the style, they should have to go through you in one way or another to 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 do it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I think that ends up being the other big side of it too. Is like, because I used to I used to get artists the benefit of the doubt of being like, man, like maybe they don't have like the resources to build on these things that they're innovating around. But then I started thinking about it when I was like, well, no, they're not stupid. So they're paying attention to the same internet that we're saying. They they see it happening. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Or at the very least their comments. You know, that's a whole other conversation. So but you are at least aware that this is happening. And then usually by the time you know, there are like small artists and influencers who do impact culture in a big way. And, you know, their ideas get taken. That's a story of all the time itself, right? Because they don't have the pool to to necessarily pull together the resources to do it. Some of them I think have uh, figure it out and make it happen, but there are a lot out there who don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, because the, the influence doesn't go far enough. Now, most of the artists that I think we think about today that are a little bit more culturally impactful, um, because of social media, they they have the resources, but they can make a tweet. Like, for example, like that was Grandmaster Flash today. He probably would have at least like 300,000 followers. He could have made a yeah. tweet or a post, like, hey, got a really cool, die for, cool you know, idea for XYZ product. You know, somebody DM me and then out the follower base, it wouldn't be unheard of the thing. Like it might be like eight or ten of those types of people following him, and like, oh, I would love to work on a product with my favorite artist. Like right. that shit happens so much today. That's true. I've seen artists innovate and build products on accident. You know what I'm saying? Just talking out loud, and then followers reach them up. So now with that in mind, I have to be less empathetic to the ones that don't do it because it's like, bro, you maybe you don't have the information to do it, but you have the eyes to see the impact this has. You know what I'm saying? You have the reach to pull the people together. Well, all you gotta do is talk about it. Like, why aren't you doing those things, right? So then my mind goes, so why aren't they doing those things? And that's the part where I'm stuck on. I think that's part of what I said earlier, where we're so busy looking at other people and yeah, okay, copycats, yeah. Yeah. Oh, this isn't cool anymore, right? Those two perspectives, right? It's not cool because other people are doing it, so I need to do something else, or just, hey man, they're copying me, stop copying me. Yeah. It's like, no, that's a sign of your influence. Keep copying me, but as you said, be the gatekeeper for their ability to copy you. Yeah, right. yeah. Because I, I think one of the biggest, I guess, flattery signs I think of any culture is an outside culture recognizing and want to be a part of it. Yeah. Right, because if, if 
if people who weren't a part of it didn't recognize and like it, then is it really a successful anti-culture? You know what I'm saying? Or are you just a motherfucker, like we were talking about earlier, just saying doing different just for the sake of doing different. Yeah. Right? But there's no community around it. So to me, well, like you said, I guess the people that's thinking about it, like, that's a good sign, right? Like that there are people who want to copy this and be a part of this and, and do these things. But yeah, to the person that's, that is, which is, because I, I know we keep saying artists, bro, but it's really mainly rappers. Like it's rappers and young artists. But young artists do be like this, bro. It's like, it's like now that I've reached the point where it's, it's, it's now, now it's counter my counter culture to be a part of this culture that I've helped create. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, and th that does that does become an issue a lot. Man, like, I'm just running through conversations I've had in my head and scenarios I've been a part of. I'm like, man, that's exactly what the fucking issue was, bro. It's like, oh, I, I, this was cool when 20 people liked it. Now 120 people, no, I don't want to touch that shit no more. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, bro, this is what we worked so hard to do. Like, imagine the world of, I don't know, somebody made diapers and those up. That's a great idea. You know what I'm saying? We should never share that with anybody. You know what I'm saying? We should just keep that to ourselves. And you know, we're gonna be we're gonna be broke, but we're gonna be the least shittiest niggas in the whole village. You know what I'm saying? Like that'd be crazy, bro. Like sell the fucking diapers, bro. Make the money, <laughs> make the money, bro. Yeah. Cap off of it. Or some because uh, what I think you no, know, it's crazy. As sad of a story as it is, one is old as time is up. If you don't, and somebody hears about it, it's it, it's over. With, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You no, know, it's it. Because somebody else is gonna be like, bro, you're tweaking. Like you got you sitting on this billion dollar idea and you don't want to do it because the niggas you built the idea with don't think it's cool anymore but it's this group of people who haven't caught on to that yet no crazy we ran with the shit it doesn't make sense <laughs> it doesn't make sense so <laughs> yeah i don't i don't know how you balance that artist sentiment with the business sentiment because it requires a little bit of setting your ego aside too mm -hmm. but you don't get caught up in that position of it yeah so you can reframe it at least as yes one that shows my influence and two this is a way for me to capitalize on my own influence versus somebody else doing it i think it should be easier to make that decision but you know there's some things that are eh they probably aren't as easy to monetize because it might not be with a hardware but let's mm -hmm. think about maybe with t-pain remember he did the he had the auto tune, yeah, right? Mike said so that he sold the auto tune thing, and and this is the thing too. Ah, I think there's a third reason that people miss out on stuff, and I've been guilty of this a lot of times throughout my life, and I try to like take this to, into account going forward. A lot of people are enamored with doing something that you might know how to do, and you don't see it as a big deal. Oh yeah, because you know how to do it yeah right and for example t-pain well he's like all i did was use these settings these settings these settings right so it's not like he didn't do anything amazing at all but from your, the user standpoint you don't even own this it's already possible to do this you just need to know how and what we get caught up in is trying to guard the way to do it by just not telling a lot of people how to do it right so it's like oh yeah I, I got my secret sauce i got my settings to make my voice sound like this and i'm just not gonna tell people all right because then if i told people they would all they would all do it they would copy so i'm less unique and i'm not monetizing off of it but the alternative perspective that allows you to gain from this is yes there is a way to do this currently however most people don't want to go through the work to do that currently. So what you can do is make it easier for them to do it. Everybody's not going to sit in the DAW and play with all these settings and move the bus around, whatever, whatever, right, whatever. No one wants to do that. No one's, everybody's not going to buy free loops or whatever you're using. So you come up with an app. All I got to do is do my, put my voice in there and it works. You know, you come up with uh, a fake mic that people can sing into, right? And it does everything that your voice um, ha gets done to it when you do it in the full blown recording studio. So sometimes it's that like there's things that you feel like I know how to do. I mean, aren't already are able to be done, but when you popularize a specific way of doing it, you can actually make it easier for people to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Like in the, in its own way, that's what like these sample packs and beat packs are. 
right? Yeah, yeah. If I, you know, I have to go chopping and digging up yeah, the wood. You don't have this. Someone already packaged it for you. So just in packaging alone, there's money and ways of capitalizing, whether you do it from a tech standpoint or whether you do it just from a, hey, actually, I put in the work to organize it for you. All right, some of these books out there that, that are bestsellers are just organizing information. You know what I mean? People buy dictionaries. <laughs> it's just putting a whole bunch of words. I package these words for you in the definitions, right? So sometimes it's, it's just repackaging things and making it easier for people to consume. And I think that's a very obvious thing from a business standpoint, where you're like, hey, let me create a course, you know, or, or let me, uh, I don't know, come up with a better, better way to deliver this food in a faster way. But when, you, when it's your own creative innovation, you don't typically think about, well, what's the more convenient way for people to do the exact same thing? Mm -hmm. And yet again, it's, it's another way to cap. So, so yeah, man, like, I mean, all of y'all creators out there, but y'all are always doing something that other people would benefit from. It's just about seeing it and how you personally balance that being in the weeds to actually innovate and then zooming out to see the results of that and how to capitalize on that. I don't know. You have to find your own, you know, <laughs> wave of how you do that and process of how you make it. Maybe that's another person, like a manager or a friend who's constantly been it. Yeah. Or maybe you got your own system, but but it's definitely something that is to your benefit along along your journey. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, man. Let me take a quick second to say, if you're an artist trying to blow your music up, or if you're a manager, a music professional in general, trying to help an artist blow their music up, I have something that's a game changer for you, and it's completely free. As you may know, we've helped multiple artists go from zero to hundreds of thousands of streams. We've helped multiple artists go from hundreds of thousands to millions of streams, chart on Billboard, go viral, all of that stuff. And we've now made the way we've branded multiple artists and helped them go viral completely free, step by step in Brandman Network. All you have to do is check out brandmannetwork.com. You apply. It's completely free. But the thing is, we're not going to let everybody in forever. So the faster you apply, the better your chance of getting accepted. Brandmannetwork.com. Check it out. Back to the video. Well, switching directions. Got to hear from my guy. I'm not going to call him my guy. Calling him my guy might get me in trouble. No, oh, yeah, man. <laughs> nah, he's my mm -hmm. guy, man. This dude funny, man. He he say a lot of crazy stuff. Oh, God. Okay. He laugh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I look at the sheet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we go, we go, we gonna skip. Oh, uh, oh, no! What we not even? No, what we gonna we gonna go about? We gonna go into that later. I forgot. We gonna save that for another episode. We're not gonna go to my guy just yet. We're gonna talk about staying in the game. How do you make ends meet staying in music? And somebody who's done this extremely well is Tank. If y'all don't know Tank, he's an R and B artist. He popped in the late nineties, early two thousands. Might have been in early two thousands, definitely, mm -hmm. but. You know, maybe I deserve was was the song that set the world aflame and had a lot of men angry at the time. Um, I wasn't old enough to have I deserve energy. Yeah, to, to <laughs> deserve the I deserve energy. So I didn't feel that same pain. You know what I mean? <laughs> I didn't have any trials, tribulations, <laughs> or wrongdoings that I I deserve the karma that he's speaking of. But with that being said. He's been a writer for so many songs. He's been a backup singer for so many songs. And I've always actually loved this about Tank because it's the lack of ego that it seems that he has. And when you talk about loving this shit, he's somebody, when I see him, the way he talks about R&B, he loves that mm -hmm. shit. And a lot of artists say, oh, I love music. I just want to be able to do music and I'll be happy. He's somebody I actually believe that shit when I see him talk about it. And specifically, especially R&B. So, why are we talking about him? Um, a lot of people didn't know that he wrote uh, Marcus Houston's song, Naked, and he did some background vocals, vocals on that song, Omarion's O, which makes so much sense, actually. It's very, very tankish when I think about it in so many, so many ways. But apparently he wrote that, and he's on the background of that. I've actually seen him talk about this in 
um, Elias. I mean, I can see him talk about this in an interview that he was the background vocals for Elias song, which is crazy because I always thought it was Aaliyah. And it did sound like a woman until I found out it was Tank. He was like, oh, yeah, that is Tank. Right. But you just assume because it's Aaliyah. Now, this I could play. I'm not playing the other songs, people, just because of copyrights, but this is just him singing, so I could play this. So, yeah, for y'all who might recognize this Aaliyah song. And that's probably my fam my most famous vocal <laughs> that, I've, that I've ever laid. He's like, oh, just sing that. Oh, and that's probably my fam my most famous vocal <laughs> that, I've, that I've ever laid. It's crazy. I did think there was a woman singing that. See? That part. Yeah, that was one. <laughs> <laughs> right? All right. But he's just been in the game for so long. He actually came up as a background singer. So that was something he did early on. He was Genuine's backup singer before he was a big artist. Mm -hmm. Right? One of those guys. So that might speak to what the the lack of ego. Um, he wrote Jerry Fox Do What It Do, which is one of my favorite songs when I was too young. But that probably to be one of my favorite songs. But again, just back to the point, like all these different songs and someone who's had his own upfront career, mm -hmm. but then also being able to play the back and be comfortable just to be around the music, to be in a group. He did the TGT thing with Tyrese and Genuine. Um, he's wrote a lot of songs. I've seen him be somebody who just helps a lot of young artists. You'll hear a lot of stor stories about that. Jamie Foxx is one of those dudes too. Like you'll, bro, you'll hear like all these random artists and people would be like, oh, yeah, uh, Jamie Foxx, like, took me in. I used to sleep at his house. Mm -hmm. And, like, Tate himself actually said he was about to go back. I think he's from Virginia or D.C. area, somewhere over there on the East Coast, right? He was about to go back because it was really rough in L.A. Um, and things weren't going like he wanted to, um, them to go. And Jamie Foxx was like, yo, man, where you going? You can't go back. He's like, what am I going to do if you're gone? We need you. Your talent. Like you're right, the way you write, man. Like you inspired me, so he brought him in, and it was just like, "Yo, bro, stay with me. Like, go figure it out, right?" And when you see people that move like Jamie and the stories um, that are around him, see people that move like Tank and the people that are around him, you could tell that for real. Again, they just love it, and there is a lot of ways if you love it that you can figure out how to make it work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and man, it's a big testament to it is just how much longer you can keep yourself in the game if you aren't afraid to take yourself out the spotlight and help yeah. some people out. You know, what exactly. I mean? There's lots of artists, man, where I think service level it always looks like like they are the reason their career is going so strong. Which you know, it, it is in a sense like it's your work ethic. You right. made these choices, but the real reason they're they're still so successful and moving so much is because of exactly that. How I'm in the back end making moves that. Uh -huh. My audience might not even know about for another 10, 20 years. You know what I'm saying? But yep. but this artist that, you know, now goes on to become something or become somebody never forgets I did that and that they're willing to still help put me in certain positions or help me do certain things or maybe even move my career for you know, as a front facing artist. So yep. like yeah, I think like it's such a wild artist mentality, but I've heard a lot of artists say things like that, like they would never help other artists do certain things or working on one stuff and it's like, nah, bro, you you open so many more doors and you become less competitive. That's another big thing. Artists are competitive, bro. Yeah. So sometimes you as an artist may not get help from another artist because they're looking at you as competition. But if you can find a very, you know, low risk way to move yourself in there or to show that, hey, like, yeah, maybe I'm competition over here, but within this realm, I can be of use to you. You know what I'm saying? I can help you do X, Y, Z thing better. That's going to unfortunately open up a lot more doors for you a lot of the time you know yeah. um because yeah. there are doors artists that you guys are, are getting shut to you guys that are getting shut because you're artists and you just don't realize it because you're artists you know what i'm saying but they're like oh you're another artist nah dead see but then you gotta have that talent too because that's true yeah. tank also brag about being a hundred percent where he can write produce you know what I mean? yeah he sing before well you know all that he could do all that himself be in the studio come back out with a full track and that thing is ready to go yeah right everybody doesn't have those multiple talents but if you do i mean one it's to your own benefit to like, have multiple talents and a more holistic view of the track but if you do you know don't keep it to yourself in my opinion right now of course personally you could just keep it all to yourself great but i feel like if you really love music, you would just want to be around it. It doesn't mean you have to disown your own career. But like, if you think about people who play instruments, it's like, all right, I might not be the one singing, 
at the moment. But I just love playing because I love music, performing, being involved in it, jamming. I've seen Bruno Mars. This is how I knew he was going to be big. Like a lot of people think, oh man, this dude is like culture vulturing or like doing the stuff he's doing now just to pop. Right? Because he's doing more like old school, old to, I mean, you know, I don't even know the years, like what, 70s, 50s yeah. to 70s, like music a lot of times. So he play with 80s too, right? But I saw Bruno Mars back in 2010. 11, 12, where he was beautiful girls. He was that guy, mm -hmm. right? And what else did he have that was more him? Because beautiful girls was oh, grenade. Grenade. Yeah. That was, yeah, he was that guy, right? So a little bit past just being beautiful girls, but like that was all so close together, right? He was that guy. But then I would go on YouTube and I became a fan of him because I was just on YouTube and I randomly came across like this commercial with him and he was like, singing his ass off and he was playing piano and it was like this it was funny the way he did it and he sang in like an old school style styles so i was like oh man this dude could really sing and then i would see performances with him backstage not on front of the stage just backstage where him and his friends would be like freestyling whether it was freestyle rapping or freestyling like playing with some of those old songs and notes and doing that like all the stuff he's doing now like he was already doing it just for fun and he brought the back behind the scenes in front of the scenes. Even if you looked at his concerts early on, he would be um like he would always have like his friends and it would be like a good time, like his band, and they would like have this relationship. It wouldn't be like my backup dancers are there and I don't see them and they're just a part of like the aesthetic. It would be like this this banter back and forth. Like they were like homies, that's what it always felt like. And then they would interact with the crowd. It almost felt like skits. So the fun that Bruno Mars emanated on 24 karat magic, you know what I mean? With, what was it technically called? 24K golden. Like y'all know what I mean though, right? <laughs> like, but that fun and that energy he started to emanate and start popping for since then, it was already something he was doing. Mm. And it was just somebody who loved the game. But you know, this guy was also an Elvis impersonator at like four years old. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you, when you watch long enough, it's interesting because you can always tell those people who are just like, oh, no, they love it, love it. And then you can see how other artists treat them too because Bruno wrote um, the shit for, for CeeLo. The, uh, not crazy. Uh, fuck you? Fuck you. Oh, shit, I ain't know that. Yeah. He was, he was part of that. He, uh, Bruno wrote a lot of stuff. He's one of those guys that just be, they just love it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and they, they write and and it kind of just is what it is. So th those people always intrigue me, and it's even more intriguing when they also find individual success. Because there's a lot of songwriters and people behind the scenes who are just ar around it and love it and whatever. But the people who get their own stardom and they're still doing that shit, it's like it just seems like an extra level of like, damn, yeah, you really, you really like breathe this shit, bro. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, mean, I too think you know, because like I said, he pays attention to a lot of old school artists. Yeah. And that was a big part of the old school artist blueprint. We're like, let's be involved in everything. Man. Collaborative. Yeah, yeah, collaborative. Yeah. So I'm gonna go write my own stuff and then when I get done with my session, I'm gonna go play guitars over here, I'm gonna go play drums over here, I'm gonna help this yep. artist with this song writing because you know, the more stories you get to be a part of, the, the more shots the kind of shot there. You know, like you said, like how many of these songwriters that are popular as artists do we know they got their start by giving their, a big song to another artist first, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that situation was even the reason that we cared about them or knew about them or maybe it gave them the resources to be able to chase their own dreams as an artist, right? Um, so yeah, a lot of doors open up when you don't close yourself off to working with other artists, even if it's sometimes maybe against like the, the competitive nature in you as an artist, you know what I'm saying? Like sometimes you, you have to do it because we as consumers are looking for that. Like I, I think it's cool as a fan to see you know, other things that my favorite artists have worked on. He's like, man, like you said, like, man, I like this. I didn't know Tank was on that. He was on, you know what I'm saying? But that's cool. You know what I'm saying? Made me like him a little bit more. Like, yeah. man, the, the, he was willing to go bang out, get some some pub credits for his little joint. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I don't know how much he getting paid for that, how many dollars he makes every time that home comes on. But who knows how his pockets or his business situation or even his credibility as an artist today would look if he had never decided to do that, you know? Yeah. So it was a good long-term investment, no matter how it felt in the moment. You know, I'm, I'm assuming it felt good because he chose to do it, but 
long term, it was a good investment because of who she became. You know what I'm saying? And like, yeah. and what kind of came from that? So it stacks up. Yeah. Creates your legend. Yeah. It's like, um, Pharrell. He's actually one of those guys. Yeah. Too. Yeah. He was like that. He's one of those guys. You can tell, you love it, being a part of everything. Yeah. He's been a front man, but he's still just comfortable and building other people up and doing songs. And I thought about him because you talk about those kind of stories. It was like when he came out, he didn't come out. Um, people were revealed. Uh, it was like some random like viral post that he was the guy on the S S uh, W B joint. Oh yeah, this yeah, yeah. I was like, dang, and it's such a small thing. Yeah. That's the double the <laughs> to me, and that's it. But it's like, oh shit, that's for real. And now that's like really cool. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. It adds to the legend that you did. Literally, you just said three letters, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And look at the impact that shit made for them. True. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that on a whole other level. So now it just looks like, dang, bro, look at how many great moments he a part of. Mm -hmm. Even though he only had a little, I mean, I don't know, he might have technically been, uh, been a producer on that too or whatever. I don't know. I know he came up under t Teddy Riley and stuff, but like, even if it was literally, he just said that one thing. It's just like, yeah, again, look at how much great shit you've been a part of. Mm -hmm. And then you start to get credit because then it doesn't feel like a coincidence. It's like, dang, the energy must just be right when he's around or something. Mm -hmm. All right. So I, I'll be, will be willing to give it up. And I just, I know we're in an age where it's harder to collaborate because people are creating music in their own. We're not forced to be in a studio where you're around people and everything. But I, I don't know. I, I definitely encourage people to figure out how they can, like, just share. You know what I mean? And and collaborate because so much comes from it anyway. Like the the experience, the stories, mm -hmm. the little shit you pick up from how other people are doing stuff anyway that you can add to your game. So you got another move in the, in, the, in the chamber. There's a lot of stuff that comes from it, but um, you know, I, I found that to be an inspiring post in general, just talking about the moments that he's been a part of. And, you know, it just it's why I like to talk to people who are doing dope shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like someone reach out to you or whatever and like they're really dope and you believe in them. Like, oh man, I don't gotta be involved in the business. So I just really believe in this shit. And then if something come of it, you know, it was just another cool moment I was a part of. Yeah, but there are a lot of people in the music industry who live life like that. Literally. Yeah. But and it's like, those people are interesting. No. <laughs> those are some interesting people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was on a jet with Drake and like Travis Scott dropped this book bag. And I was like, bro, you know, I make book bag straps. And he's like, he invested 50 million in my, you're like, what? <laughs> those, those stories are out there, bro. And those, <laughs> those sometimes those stories be having you punch air for real. And Rob was like, damn, man, why was I, why, why did I think of book bag straps? Everybody got a book bag. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, I'm going to, you know what, before we even get to this, I'm going to present a topic. Uh-oh. I mean, this ain't on the sheet, y'all, so I'm sorry I know that. <laughs> it's been on my mind, man. And I would love to know what everybody thinks. What's the difference between Rick Rubin and DJ Khaled? Between Rick Rubin and DJ Khaled? Yeah. See, I feel like... I feel like position-wise, maybe not much, because DJ Khaled also plays like instruments and does actual production, right? I don't know if you play. I, think that, I, I saw a video one, one time with him with a, um, a drum pad. I'm assuming he was really using it. It's not a full blown instrument. I mean, really Man, that could have been for the camera just just poking him. That's what I'm saying. crazy because I'm, I'm actually making an argument in that direction, but still, I don't know. I, I doubt it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm going to give him a bit of a doubt okay. and say he does. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, they both can do that. I would have to say on paper, well, service level, not much, but on paper, the, I think the vibes they bring to the studio sessions are different. Like, I, I feel like a studio session with Rick Rubin is like candles everywhere, maybe like light snacks, like grapes and mini bottles of waters and crackers and things like that. And it's a lot and more- a couch. Yeah. You have a couch. Couch somewhere, probably incense playing, maybe like a yoga shaman in the corner. And I feel like DJ Cow is like the complete opposite. Like, it's like wings everywhere. Like alcohol, there's a lot of music playing in a different room in the back. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Maybe like three or four like studio bad bitches. Just the hell. Like, I feel like the vibes are completely different. They bring to bring what they bring out of an artist. Here's my thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I say this as somebody who has been rocking with and studying Rick for a long time. So 
the reason I say this is funny enough. Someone who's been an admirer of what Rick Rubin has built for a long time. And I'm talking about going back to early 2000s when I was younger because watching stuff with him and Russell Simmons and documentaries and stuff. Somebody who's been admired for that long. I still always have like my independent thinking and way of questioning. So it's like I've felt this way, but now Rick Rubin has become like hot with our younger crowd, right? You got that podcast, man. You know, that podcast be him in the, in the field. The podcast, the Joe Rogan interview. There's a lot of people that are like, oh yeah, I want to be like Rick Rubin and and like, you know, whatever. And, they are, and now they're even using him as like clout points. Like, you know, when it's like a cool person to say that you actually know who that person is or you drop the quote from that person, mm-hmm. he's becoming that person, right? Now, at the end of the day, Rick himself be like, I don't really got no talents. I just listen. I just got my ear and I give my opinion. That's what Rick says. That's what he said, man. What's the knock against DJ Khaled? People be like, he don't got no talent. He just be moving stuff together. <laughs> he just put people together. <laughs> it's the same thing, right? Which is interesting because Again, like I said, I've admired and watched Rick for a long time. So this isn't hating for those people who can't understand nuance. This is me trying to question the weird hypocrisy that comes into play because of that. It's like, all right, it's one thing to be like, you just don't like DJ Khaled vibe. You don't like that he be talking and he's loud. You know, his approach, his energy, which I can see that type of person who has to like hustle and move in that way. And his background versus Rick's background and how things culminated are completely different. Mm -hmm. Please don't get it twisted. DJ Khaled didn't have to grind different. If you, so I understand how he can turn, be a turnoff, but say it's a turnoff because of him. Don't, don't diminish what what he's created or what he's been a part of because he doesn't have this skill or that skill. When you love this other guy, and don't talk about the fact that he doesn't have this skill or that skill. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's Morgan and Brandon, though. That's what I call it. Yeah, I was about to say, I think the ironic thing of it is, well, not, well, it is kind of ironic. I think Rick Rubin gets a little bit more love because his look and the way he kind of talks about things goes hand in hand with the whole like indie movement going on right like be yourself you don't have to conform to this real philosophizing yeah yeah you know shaman type guy yeah yeah right, man. approach and like dj Khaled, like the surface level represents industry right the the, the motherfuckers buying the the billboards and gaming the the the, the 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 grammys and shit you know what i'm saying like he represents that crowd what's funny is that like i said on paper that's how it looks but the service level they're both the industry person you know what I'm saying? like when rick, rick rubin be philosophical talking about shit he be talking in his head he thinking about the time he worked with like travis scott or drake or some shit yeah you know what i'm saying he's not thinking about you know little whatever you know what i'm saying so he's, <laughs> in that sense he's really no different oh yeah i see what you're saying yeah. like his brand is like down to earth but his experiences are not. Yeah, he in space. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> so he's like saying something from up here, but in a way that makes you here feel here, and you think he's here with you, but it's like no, he's thinking about up here. You know so they're both thinking mainstream. Like Rick Rubin dropped the song and all his philosophicalness, and that shit did less than three hundred k. He's like he probably sick. You know, you think he care about that? I don't think he care about that. Though. I think you do. I think he's at a point where he can make us think he doesn't care because he has so much of it. It's like, like for real. Like, for real, they would be like, I don't really care about the Grammys. I'm like, yeah, nigga, you for real. Of course you don't care at this point. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, of course, at this point, it doesn't make sense for you to care. Yeah. You know, so I think he doesn't, it, I think him not caring is authentic because he's already reached that point so many times. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's, like a, it's like a billionaire telling you he don't care about money. It's like, yeah, I mean, I guess you've worked to the point where you don't have to oh, deal yeah. with it. You know what I'm saying? The fake shit. Right <laughs> the, particularly the self-made folks. It's like, yeah. You rich and you talking about work life balance and you need to do yeah. sound baths and saunas all the time. And now you got people thinking that that's what they need to do. When it's like, bro, but the what happened to twenty years? Yeah, in between that, <laughs> bro. Before that. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, to me it's the exact same vibe, but like I think it's a, I think deeper than surface level they're the same person. Surface level they're not. 
you know. And Rick Rubin's the only person in the music industry that can get away with being famous and looking disheveled all the time. And I, I, I think it's, you know, it's all that brand. yeah, it's part of the brand, right? But he's the only person in the music industry that can get away with not looking clean all the time. It's crazy. The with the dirty feet, feet on your couch, type shit. Baby, doing. Boy, and Post Malone. Post Malone gets away with it too. Post Malone. I watch Post Malone interviews. That man, that man be saying some wild shit. See that? I mean, that right there. And he live on a ranch, so I know his feet dirty. That right there might be. <laughs> you know, there's there's other things that come with why that is or why that is. I don't want to go down that route. <laughs> That's a, <laughs> that'll take us a different direction, but. Like, I think it's interesting to observe, right, at the same time. Because it, if you think about mapping out your own career, right, the utility of a conversation like that is these people, generally speaking, have a very similar skill set or what they provide. You could say one's better to you or, or the other is better to you. That's fine. But with that being in mind, there being a similar skill set, the outcome is completely different. They're both successful, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But the way it looks, the way it feels, and that's when you start thinking about what do I want my brand to be? You know, how do I want to move and what moves are necessary to pattern after to get anywhere in that direction? So I think he's done a good job at, well, both of them done a good job at doing it the way they want to do it. But that conversation, I feel like people need to address the hypocrisy in that to really see every, see it for what it is, what makes them them, and why do you hate one, or why do you love the other, or why do you love the other one and hate, hate one? Because I feel like with that type of approach, the Rick Rubin approach, hey, people like that are usually assholes, bro. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, I don't necessarily mean that in a bad way, but it's like they have like this very peaceful way of like communicating, but then also what comes with that peaceful way of communicating, but strong mindedness that created the work that they have, that perspective comes with strong opinions and ways of doing things. So in some categories, people end up like, oh, wait, I thought this person was all peace, but he's pretty brash and he's pretty straightforward. So, you know, that there's some people that probably are like, damn, I don't like this. <laughs> you know, like he's He's an asshole because he has a specific, oh, yeah, that's trash. Like, you know, it's some stuff like, yeah, that's bad. Like, his whole thing of why he even started, um, like, a lot of his, it was, like, this perspective of, like, let's fuck the music up because it's perfect. Music is too, I don't know, like, lame or boring. I, I, whatever words he would use at that time was, like, with the 80s or some shit. But that was his whole his whole thing. It was kind of like the rebellious rocker kid. I'm from a pretty good background, but I'm like rebelling and I don't really care about a lot of this shit. That takes a certain type of mind mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Yeah. All right. So I don't know, man. Yeah, I just needed it's an answer that's been a question that's been on my heart. I ain't mean, know where you was going. Hey, man. I ain't gonna lie, bro. I've I just <laughs> so many people all of a sudden be on that bandwagon, and I'm cool with that. I'm not one of those people that. Like we ref referenced earlier, all of a sudden, oh, this person ain't cool because too many people think he's cool. Mm. I'm not that, but I'm just like, y'all are just shitting on DJ Khaled so hard, but y'all love this man. And what's the difference? The rollout. <laughs> and DJ Khaled ain't giving us quotables that fit over classical music. He said he said he's not. Right? He's not. He's not. His quotables fit over like trap beats, ah. like workout music. Yeah. Yeah, I can give you that. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you that, man. I can give you that. Oh, man. Let's switch it up, man. Let's get into the science of creating music because designer says, hey, he got the sauce with creating hits. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> you, have to, you have to give me that, man. No, man. I mean, you know, I like designer, bro. So, Let's see what he got to say. Just the headline, though, uh, hit me different. Diamond artist, I'm not no joke of an artist. I take this thing serious down with the vowels, the A's and the I's and the U's. I can tell you why songs are hits. The A's the biggest vowel that catches the human ear. When I go A, 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 enjoy before you air. But songs like Panda and Gucci Gang, what's the vowel that you hear? It's the A. Uh, Gucci, Gucci, Gucci Gang, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the A. Your ear catches only vowels. Once I understand that, I know how to make things with vowels and learn how to always keep the A included. The I's, make sure the G, because the G make you go, go, 
Good, good. That's why I say I get a whole lot of money. That is a great science. I never thought about that ever. Notice every song that's number one, it always got the A. Bodak Yellow, what was that? Oh, that, 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 me if you wanted. The U, if you wanted to. These expensive, these is red bottom, these is bloody shoes. Does it have to be the actual U or does, does it have to sound like I just it? have to sound in the cadence in the U. That's how we would talk if we didn't have this language. You so. know what else makes me think about that? I always wondered Nelly. Mm -hmm. E-R, E-R. Uh -oh. Yeah, yeah, that's all about. Or oh, a baby, bay. wow! I'm a diamond. All right, Jacory, you just laughed. So I want to, I want to know what you were laughing about before we even get into this. Because it doesn't feel like Charlamagne is taking him serious. <laughs> feels like, feels like when like your little cousin calls him, like, oh, look at like my work for my job. You're like, what you do? He's like, I'm a scientist. He's like, oh yeah, buddy, you're a scientist. Like, where's your work on that? You got some black. <laughs> that's what, that's what it felt like. You know what I'm saying? Well, I do feel like he's talking about a real. Science, and you know, I feel like phonetic science is, is more than likely a real thing, you know. Yeah, you know, but yeah. no, nah, I feel like Shaw Man was just fucking with him, bro. I would love to know if a lot of the artists out there are paying attention to their music like this, but I can't verify from my experience and many people that I know who have been songwriters basically vouching for this type of thing. Not saying what he just said specifically, um, but basically talking about there are certain things that you can do that are going to create earworms mm -hmm. all right that was one of the earlier terms that i heard where it's like it sits in your ears like easy to repeat so some of them chants and things like that that you might not even like but it's stuck with you it's stuck with you right? there's ways you can do that pers purposefully or increase the chances so i want to read the comments though before i go into some of the experiences and things i've heard people talk about because might pretty notable. Let me see. Mike Will made it. Said, interesting, but I don't know about this one. Produced a couple of hits with no vowels. Mm -hmm. I would love to know which hits those are because with no vowels, it's hard to create a sentence with no vowels. Yeah, that's all. Was... A hit with no vowels. I feel like that would have been the narrative of the hit. No, I click on that view reply real quick. Somebody, somebody, what did it say? I'm like, God, says, I need to, I need to gas it up. It's a <laughs> cat speaking with no vowels. Exactly. So I was like, what? It's an H. I might well made it. I understand. I think there's more than one way to make a hit. Let me see. A song with with vowels without vowels is impossible, my boy. That's what I'm saying, bro. Like, I mean, that that is a real science. If he yeah. did, that's magic. Either he was trolling or he wasn't fully comprehended. You know what I'm saying? And I think more importantly is what he's saying is exaggerating specific vowels. All right, because again. It's like, well, every song, no matter what that you create, it's going to have vowels on it, whether you try or not. All right. So I'm sure he really means like the way you focus on those vowels and how you place it within the, like the melody. Yeah. Making yeah. their own sounds. And things. Right. Now, what is, what would somebody say? What would a hater say? Hey bro, how come you don't got no more hits then? You had no first few hits. What's up? Now to that, I say, just because you can make a hit song don't mean it's going to be a hit. There's a belief that every hit song is a hit. I don't believe that because we know that there's other factors. It still has to get to a certain mass of attention, mm -hmm. right? So there's other things that can get in the way. But what I would say is you create the best song and then judging it all things equal when it gets to a certain point, the song with the hit elements, whatever that means, will do better than the other song that made it to that same point. All right. Cause a song can be successful and have hit like features in terms of how before it was in the market and not necessarily be the songs that we like no know are like hit hits. You know what I mean? Some songs that are like number one on the charts, but it's different than some of the other songs. They're like number one classics, generation, generation. Oh yeah, this shit is yeah, for real bona fide hit. Yeah. Right. So I think the, paying attention to those elements that he's talking about probably improved that because there's a guy I know that was a writer. He's uh, worked a lot in the gospel space back in the day. He wrote for Boys to Men early on. He would all tell me all these stories. So an older this gentleman. And he would tell me even in the church, like the science of it all, right? And like you can play certain notes to make somebody cry like you already know it's gonna be improved chance right you want people to rejoice there's certain notes right or you get like jump into it it's just something manipulative so i ain't gonna lie. 
he 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 played <laughs> that idea that you know it can be used for evil. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and they 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 call the devil what the angel of music or whatever they they uh they call it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. So that's there, right? But knowing that the that if that's true, then I can't see something like this not having some merit to it too. Yeah, that's all, that's all I'm, bro. I think it's right messengers messes i think just the messenger gonna throw people off yeah, yeah people got exactly. questions yeah exactly people. people got questions i mean but look that's how it is too when you think about anything anybody who gets really good at it is because they find the science in it mm -hmm. everything's art but every art has a science within it and you can flip it vice versa they interact it's hard to have them without the other mm -hmm. even if you can't see it within it's always there and i had this conversation all the time with my wife i be talking to my trainer about it like Part of the way I I talk is because I'm a marketer, and like the shit that y'all be commenting, y'all feel like I be like ruining moments. You yeah. see what I mean? Or I, I don't even consider myself skeptical. I'm like, no, they're I'm not even trying to say they're bad. I'm just saying this is what's happening because I would do the same thing. This is just how it goes, <laughs> right? Do I see it all differently? But you interact with people who don't have that like mind and understand how other people's minds can be manipulated and they think yo bro like why you why you so skeptical why you gotta be a debbie downer like i'm like hey man look when you see how you can manipulate things you instantly look at the rest of the world and you see how everybody else is manipulating things mm -hmm. that i ain't trying to check to see what you only got got exactly damn they got me i was like I and and i'd be stirring with it so i'm like oh nope i refuse to get got if i <laughs> see what he's doing <laughs> Like, oh no, he's giving he's trying to give me this deal or I'm at the store and it's like, no, I'm not gonna eat this just because they uh, had the crib. <laughs> I'll be taking it personally. <laughs> it's like, no, I wanna decide based on my own thoughts. <laughs> so I know I can ruin some moments, but it's hard to not see that shit. <laughs> like you you see it at all times. You not yeah, yeah, I'll be looking for it, man. And sometimes I allow myself to get God just to yes, learn. Just exactly. to learn. You know? I'm like, you know what? I know exactly where this is going, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that's exact that's a whole another side of it yeah you, you go down to experience it's like a ride yeah like i'm learning here yeah. like I, if i do, ride this ride well i'll come out the other side with some knowledge if i don't then i spent like 219 or something you know what i'm saying like either way exactly. i'm willing to take the risk <laughs> like bro like me personally like, i'm a sucker for a new sign like i'll try anything with my whole a new sign if it got a new one i'm trying it <laughs> like going to the gas station it's like ooh, try these four new unlimited Skittles flavors, buy a pack of each. I'm a sucker for a new. Just trigger. I'm, I'm, I'm probably gonna get some gummy worms today, bro. <laughs> just, I be trying not to think about candy at all. Cause once it gets there, really, it'd be hard, man, for me to stay away from it. I mean, I'm not even playing. Yeah, now, it's a good time to get a little gummy worm <laughs> on a bad bro. You know, Easter coming up, and this be around time when they go crazy with the gummy fruity candy. You know what I'm saying? The Easter Starburst should be coming out pretty soon. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, look. Oh, so you, you know the game too well. Yeah, bro, what? You gotta know what seasons they drop what candies, bro. Yeah, you were, you were, like, uh, springtime, they go hard on the fruit candies, bro. I'm guessing because it's a summer, spring thing, you know? But, hey, the fruit candies be up here at this point. You got that strong, sweet tooth, man? No, nah, not crazy, but I just know. Yeah, yeah. I ain't a big candy person. Oh, you just, like, just I might eat candy maybe like, maybe like twice a month. Once, once every 15 days, it's not bad. It's interesting that you know it, though. <laughs> I don't know. It makes, makes me feel like you're a candy person that makes yourself not a candy person because you have to control it. Oh, yeah. No, when I was younger, yeah, it was bad. You know what I'm I feel like we all started <laughs> out there. But like, I just as I got older, I was like, man, you know, it should be fucking with my sleep. Like, I'm up when I ain't planning on it. That's true. You know what I'm saying? I'm more of like a like a savory guy. So I like pastries and stuff more than I like candy. Candy and uh, like savory. So like, I go get like a... Yeah. Like a like a cinnamon apple biscuit before I go get like a Twix. You know what I'm saying? Oh, okay. the, the biscuit the biscuit gonna hit different. You know what I'm saying? So I ain't completely removed. I just chosen my poison. This is a whole another food <laughs> conversation. I'm a I'm gonna get this last topic out the way because we about to go real deep in food. Bro. But I I got another wing spot, man. Oh shit, they okay. I I I should go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wasn't looking, but it found me part of my problem all right let's play this last clip 
every popular song sounds the same. Here's why. That's the title of this video. We'll put it in the link in the description. But there's a specific segment of this video that we want you guys to hear. Check this out. Scientists have studied 464,000 songs and found that both melodies and sounds of instruments are becoming much more similar. Songs are also becoming shorter because of this and streaming platforms are prioritizing those shorter songs, mainly because shorter songs are less likely to be skipped. And even if we disregard the studies that I just mentioned, you don't really need one to see that the majority of popular music is painfully similar in its respective genres. I believe a lot of this is due to the fact that when record labels gained back their influence after briefly losing it, they began developing technology that would make them even better at promoting generic popular music. And from a business standpoint, it makes sense that a label would want to put out safe music, music that they know people will like. In the past two decades, labels have even acquired technology that they can use to analyze music and predict what songs will be hits. They can use services such as Hit Predictor or Shazam to see what songs will blow up. Apparently, Hit Predictor was able to predict 48 out of the top 50 radio hits in 2013. There are actually even entire companies such as Next Big Sound, which are dedicated to analyzing music and finding the next big sound. Previously, executives at record labels would just make these decisions based on their gut, but now they can rely on this data. And you're probably thinking that if labels keep pumping out this generic music, people will eventually get tired of it. And while that may be true for some people, science says it actually is for the majority. In a study done by Columbia University in 2006, they showed some people music websites with a bunch of songs and told them to download their favorites. Some sites had rankings of the most popular songs and some didn't. It showed that people who saw the rankings were more likely to download the popular songs. They then did a second experiment where they did the same thing, but this time they sent out websites with the actual download statistics and then some websites with fake download statistics. The experiment proved again that believing that a song is more popular made people Oops made people more likely to download it. Another study done in 2011 shows that the brain produces dopamine when people hear songs that they have played and heard before. So essentially what this all means is that a label can have teams of people working on making a boring song. They can put the song onto the streaming services and manipulate it so it gets more popular. You hear it over and over again and you end up liking it and boom, you have a chart topping Hot 100 number one song and you're rich and you're famous and the label's making tons of money. And for all those reasons, that's all it takes. Get rich. Take that information and go get rich, people. He said some shit, man. Man, he he, he said something that hit me, man. You know, with the the whole the dopamine release when people hear familiar music, mm -hmm. and that makes me think of um, you know, it's one of those things like artists may notice it. Like, why are like all oh, all these artists and audio files? All oh, all these songs sound the same, yep. but then like the general consumer isn't thinking about that, or if they do, like they're glad. You know, based on what he's saying, they're like, hey, like this does kind of sound like the last song, and I like that last song, so I should like this one, you know, man. Let's, let's keep this vibe going. Um, so I agree, man. I agree. I agree with everything he said. Well, first of all, shout out to Matty Balls. Um, I really don't know you like that, but I love this video that I that um I got put on to you by. Keep on creating and creating stuff like this so y'all can check him out on YouTube. But <laughs> that's a couple of things here. One, he talked about the idea of people downloading from the uh, music and being more likely to download music based on it already having streams, right? Or interaction. Social proof, right? We already know this and it works. Mm -hmm. And many people want to hear that again and think, well, oh man, people just want to listen to what's popular and, and they don't have any taste. Nobody cares about underground artists versus big artists. I implore you guys go past the surface level. Not just about that. I know that's always the first thought and way to go, but typically the the bitter thought is in the is in the actual answer, right? That thought that makes you bitter like, "Oh, man, they just don't appreciate." That's usually more your personal feelings and ego yeah. versus the actual answer. Yeah. Like what it really comes down to cuz you can't use that. Like you can't actually utilize that. And, uh, you're not in control. What puts you in control is realizing what it comes down to, and that comes down to convenience, saving time. How many times can I talk about the fact that we're hit with so much information time and time again, and we're just trying to figure out how to make the best decisions for our lives possible? That's it. Everybody is like, what's the best person to date? What's the best school to go to? What's the best job to work? How can I make more money faster and and do it at, with less risk, right? 
for entertainment, how can I watch the best movie that I'm going to enjoy instead of wasting my time? And how can I spend as little time possible listening to it? I've been looking for it. Ask a friend. Look at what? Reviews and shit like that. And streams, they're like reviews. You just assume because it's been listened to that, yeah. that other people must like it. So it must not be trash completely. Which means I'm not gonna waste my time by giving it a chance, mm -hmm. right? Because if I listen to something with zero, I don't know. That's that's a risk, and it is a risk. Even us who who like are in this, and we're always looking for new artists and stuff to hear. You go on to a smaller artist profile, but hey, this his top song has ten thousand streams. The rest of the songs have two hundred. You are gonna be like, All right, let me listen to this ten thousand. Just see what the people saw here. Yeah, let me see what they saw in this one versus the other. Yeah, right. So. It's a natural thing for us to do. It's a natural thing to say, you know what? I want Amazon. Let me buy this product that has 3,000 reviews versus that seller with the product that has zero reviews. Mm -hmm. It sounds kind of risky, even if I can get it returned because Amazon's pretty decent with returns. I'm going to have to buy it and be disappointed, then send it back. All right. It's just a risk. <laughs> That's all it is. So we have to like kind of just continuously come to grips with that. Uh, we're all doing that same thing in many spaces and places. And the only way to opt out of that is to be consciously working against it. And nobody's going to be doing that 24 seven. Mm. Uh, even the underground artists themselves are still doing that. Like I said, you could be looking at your favorite artist and be like, dang, this is the new album. This song has a lot of stats. It, you might not have time. Like, Let me just hear one real quick mm -hmm. to kind of get a pulse of what the rest of it's like. This is the one that, uh, like this is this is the one that has all the views, so let me check that one out. Mm -hmm. Right. So look, it is what it is on that side. And then he made another statement. Um talk about songs getting shorter. Songs getting shorter, which is another thing, yeah, improving the, the light list for to be listened to, which helps boost the algorithm, which of course of course ultimately gets more awareness and leads to it being a hit. That was another one, but it was the other thing that you addressed too that he talked about the end. Uh when he said, um, Science has shown that we get a dopamine hit when we hear yes. songs we heard before. There it is, right? What do you think that comes from? Why do you think that is? I think that people are lazy and we like to enjoy things that have been enjoyable to us before because sometimes learning that some to figure out if something else is enjoyable for you is work and a risk, like you said, right? Yeah. So I could take the risk. Maybe I like this new sound. Maybe I don't. Or I can just lean really heavy towards the thing that I know I already enjoy and I already like. Most people are gonna pick that one. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's what that's what I was thinking. It's just like we heard it, we like it, we know we like it. I want to hear more of this. I can see that from two perspectives. It's like, yes, I'm about to experience something I've already decided I liked. Mm -hmm. So it's cool. I don't have to go through that period with my guard up, wondering if I'm gonna like it, observe actively. That's real energy for me to pay attention. Yeah. Oh shit. And I might not like it. All right. We're Wait constantly then. working to not pay attention. So as a quick aside, do you know why time seems to move faster when we're adults than it does when we're children? Because we pay more attention to it. We pay less attention. To time? When we get older, yeah. I feel like I pay more attention to time. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> we pay more attention to time, but that's that actually proves the point further. Because when you're paying more attention to time, time would actually move slower. Right? It's because we're not paying as much attention because we've seen so many things and information is so accustomed to. We just move. And because we're, we're we're constantly trying to figure out how can I make less decisions so we fall into these habits. Mm. Right? I already know what I'm going to put on. I, have to, I don't have to think about brushing my teeth. Right? I don't have to think about all these different things. So we make decisions ahead of time as we build these habits. That's all it basically is, right? So we use less energy and we're more aware of the world and the environment. Mm. Kids, everything is new. So you're paying a whole lot of attention to everything and you're consuming and then you're being stimulated. And when you're paying attention to something, time moves slower. So if you think about, you probably haven't done this since you were a kid. But this is a clear example of how, no, if you pay attention to time and move slower, when you're waiting for your motherfucking class to be over, and you just keep looking back at the clock. Oh, yeah. And it's still like, 
Hey, bro, this is taking forever. This is the longest five minutes of my life. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, we all been there in school. And man, shoot, we've been there at work and it's our places and times in life, right? Time moves slower when you're paying attention to it. Things move slower when you focus on it. But as an adult, to prove that same point about new experiences, when you go on vacation, an extended vacation, you have all these new experiences and you're in a new place. It feels like you go into this time warp, mm-hmm. right? And then you go back to your same world pace and then things move like fast again because you're already accustomed to it. You're not getting all these new experiences so the days don't feel as long. So with that in mind, right, what was that last point you said again? I was uh, The dopamine. The dopamine rush. Yeah, the dopamine rush. Right. Right. Yep. So all of that stuff interrelates because like nostalgia is a very, very real thing for us, Mm -hmm. right? New experiences is also a very real thing. However, new experiences take more time and energy. And when you're moving at your pace, oftentimes, unless you're deciding, I need to vacate or or set aside time, we're just looking for the thing that takes less energy. So I would love to get a nostalgic hit because I've already decided I like this. I already have an environment and this entire experience that came along with it. So I can get that same feeling without having to go through the inconvenience of experiencing that again. It's like I get the experience without the investment. Yeah. That's all nostalgia is. Yeah, all the gold without the risk. I get all the gold without the risk. So well, yeah, I'm I'm back in that environment when I was listening to this song and I was at that party without having to go to the party. Without having to have the risk of somebody pulling out a gun at any moment and me having to dip and look at the wall. <laughs> you know what I'm mean? saying? Like, that's all all nostalgia is, but that's one of the primary like attractions to nostalgia. You get the benefits without the risk or without the investment. So us getting that dopamine rush, to me, is no surprise when you do that with um, these songs, right? But I think there's a, a good and bad to that, obviously, because it's one thing when we're talking about nostalgia and something you genuinely decided that you love, right? Or something that you already decided that you liked. And now it's like, oh man, good. I already like this. I'm happy that that is on. I'm hearing it. But what about the stuff that you've heard? Not because you liked it. You heard it because you heard it. You heard it because some marketer got that shit bumping around you at all times. And that's just it what do you do then it's like now I like it more because I heard it again even though I didn't really like it to, to start with I've had songs like that well, that's the game bro that, and that's the game that's even the game. as a marketer I know that there's songs that I liked them more the more I heard them and and there's some that like legitimately oh I just I was just slipping I, I really didn't give it the do with the attention that I should have but there's a lot of songs that I like or I, I or I grew more fondness of because I heard it more times and then eventually especially it became nostalgic mm-hmm. like I wasn't even listening to this song like that in that year but now it reminds me of that year and that year was a good ass year so damn this song now almost kind of feels like a good song mm-hmm. it's a different way in to somebody's psyche you know Ryan Leslie did that shit to Diddy right no where, where one of his songs no well, yes, Ryan Leslie song. So that was how he got signed. Diddy, somebody who knows music, obviously, has been a part of creating some real good music. Ryan Leslie, I think he knew Diddy's DJ, right? So everywhere Diddy would go, he would get his song playing. Oh, okay. And Diddy heard it so much, eventually he's like, who is this guy? Yeah. Because to him, it now feels like this song is everywhere. Everybody's fucking with it. Cause it's not like I'm saying, hey, play this song. So why does everybody keep playing this song? It must be some kind of hit, like something that's on the charts right now. And who is this guy? Eventually, you know, him and Ryan link up. He finds out who it is and then he gets side to Diddy and Diddy takes his girl. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Man, bro, that was a plot twist. <laughs> great. I feel like great story. You know what I'm saying? Great lesson in there somewhere. <laughs> Probably a couple lessons in there somewhere, honestly. You know what I'm saying? But Probably a shout out to the DJ, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to 
Shout out to the music. I didn't make that story up. And that's just the, that's just the word on the street there and from from people involved. But anyway, <laughs> we're gonna end it right there. This episode number thirty eight. I mean, no labels necessary. I'm Brandon Shaw. I'm Corey, and we out. Peace.